So tonight, I want to give you the four pillars of faith in God's Word. I will guarantee you on the authority of the Word of God, if you will take these four pillars of faith from God's Holy Word and begin to use them in your life, then you will find your life literally transformed. I mean like in a week or two, and sometimes a day or two. And that you will be able to, to, uh, to not only help yourself, but to help others. There are four pillars of faith in the Word of God, and they are this. You must know what God has promised, because you can't claim a promise if you don't know it's there. You may be rich, but it won't do you any good if you don't know that rich relative has died and left you a fortune. So we must know what He's promised. We must know why He answers our prayers. Because unless we know why, this is why we're not getting answers to our prayers most of the time. We must know when He answers our prayers. That's very important because a lot of people are not getting the answer because they don't know when to take it. Then we must know, fourthly, what He requires of us. Now, these are four pillars of faith that will work for any promise that God has given us. Now, these are teaching seminars, and if you'll listen carefully, you're going to find that these things do work, and you can begin right tonight to be healed, to see that loved one saved, to deliver yourself from that oppression. You don't, my friends, you don't need religious counseling. Some of you think you do. You just need to know how to believe God for yourself, and you can deliver yourself. God has never sent me to counsel with people. He's sent me to do my counseling in the pulpit. He's given me an anointed teaching ministry. And I'm going to show you tonight how you can set yourself free because he said this is a prison ministry where you'll set people free with this word. Well, I'm going to give them one at a time. What, first of all, to know, the first pillar of faith is to know what God has promised us. This is 1 John 5, 14 and 15. To know what he's promised. He says, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And we know that if he hears us, then we have the petition we desired of him. So the first pillar of faith is faith in the word of God. He says, if I hear you, I give you what you ask. If you ask according to my will, I hear you. And the only way that we can get God to hear us is to ask according to His will. And the only way we can ask according to His will is to know what He said. There are no shortcuts. I'm sorry to disappoint you. If I am disappointing anyone, there are no shortcuts to faith. It's the pathway of Romans 10, 17. For faith cometh by hearing the Word of God. There's no other way. There's not another verse in Scripture that tells you how to get faith. You see? And so God has not said He answers your prayers. He did not say He will answer you because you fast in prayer, because you're sincere, because you love Him, or because you have a need. He says, I will answer you when you ask according to my will. That means that every time you ask according to His will, He hears you, and He says, if I hear you, you have, past tense, the petition. You see, I get answers to my prayers. Do you know what it is to get 100% answers to your prayers? Do you know what it is to get answers every day? Jesus did. And that's why He ordained prayer, so that you can. Oh, he's more disappointed than you are when you don't get an answer. Because he ordained prayer so he could answer you. He made you the promise, but you must know his word. And you see, the churches are filled with Christians who are sick and dying because they do not know healing was provided in the atonement and promised in the word. And if they would get into the word, this is why the word, faith in the word, is the basic pillar. If they would get into the word, they would see that sickness is from Satan, Acts 10, 38, and that healing is from God, Psalm 103, verse 3 among many, many passages that show that. But you see, your faith can't rise any higher than the level of what you know God has promised you in the Word. And it's the pathway of Romans 10, 17. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing the Word. I don't mean just hearing somebody recite doctrine, but hearing the anointed Word. And he didn't say reading the Word. It does come by reading, but uh, the only passage in the Bible tells you how to get this faith we're talking about is hearing the Word. That's why he's sending out anointed ministry. Oh, I wish I had time to go into the fact that, that God has set ministry in the church for a purpose if we didn't need it. Don't you realize what the gift of teaching is? I'm that teacher over in Ephesians 4.11. He's not talking about Sunday school teachers there. He's talking about a teacher that's anointed with the gift of teaching that ministers to the whole body of Christ. And a teacher is not an interpreter. 
He's not an expositor. He's not an explainer, because you always explain things away. He's not someone who writes commentaries to tell you what God really meant. All a teacher is is one anointed by the Spirit who can, under the anointing, begin to put together what God has said so that you can understand it. And a teacher that can't communicate has never been called of God. I used to sit in college and just say about certain teachers myself that I don't know a thing about the course, but I could communicate better than they do. All I would have to do is read the lesson before I came to class. I mean, they couldn't communicate. They had no gift of teaching. And so... Uh, faith comes by hearing the Word. And, and, and he says, if we ask anything according to His will, then He hears us. And so faith in the Word is the basic pillar. I have people sometimes, you know, they'll say, well, I know faith is important, but I've been taught in my church to pray through. That God expects us to get a hold of Him and get down and beg and plead and pray and fast and, and just hold on till we pray through. I believe in praying through. Well, I believe in praying through too. I pray once and then I'm through. That's the prayer of faith. Because if you pray ten times for the same promise, you prayed nine times in unbelief. Now, come on. He said, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe you have received. And then you shall have it. If you believe you have received when you prayed, then why did you pray twice? About the promise. Now, please hear what I said. I'm talking about God's promises. When I don't know His will... I pray just like anyone else, Lord, show me your will, if it be thy will. But I'm talking about what God has written here for. Here, here is a revelation of his will. It's filled with the knowledge of his will. And, and, and we've been taught to explain it away. We've been taught, you know, when he says in Luke eleven thirteen that if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? We've been taught, you know, uh, that th means a thousand things but the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You see, and that's, that isn't, it doesn't mean anything but the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because that's where I got the baptism on Luke eleven thirteen, And that's what I quote to the countless hundreds I've prayed for have received the baptism. And so, uh, if you mean though by praying through, begging and pleading all night for God to do what He's promised in the Word, then I would say His Word's not abiding in your heart. Because he said, if you abide in me and my word abides in you, then you can ask what you will and it will be done for you. All you have to do is know his word. And when I can get Christians into the word, then I find they don't have to sit up all night and beg and plead for God to do what he said he'd already had done for them. They'll only believe it. But there are no shortcuts. You've got to pay the cost. You've got to come out to meetings like this. You've got to, to be filled with the Spirit. And you've got to spend some time with the Lord and with his word. I mean more than just daily Bible readings, friends. You don't need a theological education, but you do need some time with the Lord in His Word. And the Spirit will teach you the Word. I could tell you about uneducated people uh, that uh, are doing tremendous things by faith. And they can't speak good English, and uh, some of them don't read so well. But they, they, what they read, they, they can put into practice. They're not trying to explain it away, but it takes time. To get into the Word. And I find if I can get people into the Word and get them to hear it over and over and over and over. Well, I've been preaching on faith in some places for years. And people began to respond automatically to the Word of faith. And you can get healed just sitting there by listening to the Word of faith. But faith doesn't come easy. It comes by hearing the Word of God. Uh, I, just to make my point, I don't know how many of you will be back for the three days that we're going to be teaching on faith. You see, I don't know that. It's just part of the cost that we have to pay because, you see, uh, whatever is so important has to be set aside. When God sets ministry, anointed ministry into Atlanta, we have to set aside something else for that week. We just have to do it. If I'm making my point uh, to some of you, praise the Lord. Because you'd be surprised how many come after every time. Even though I'm saying this, some will do it anyway. Now you watch. And I'm not saying it critically or anything. I'm just saying it because it's true. People will come right after me saying they will do this. They'll do it. And say, I want special counseling and ministry now or in the morning because I can't get back tomorrow afternoon or tomorrow night. <laughs> they always tell you they can't get back. Well, I'll say, faith comes by hearing the Word because I can't counsel with you like I can preach. Something happens when I get up out of the chair. that uh, it just does, it's, it's different. Because faith comes by hearing the Word. And you, you would find that's true. I'm a pretty quiet fellow. 
People always want to take me out and feed me and all of that, but I, I like to be alone with the Lord, and I, I read His Word, and I study, and I pray, and I'm writing books, and I'm just, uh, uh, I'm not antisocial, uh, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm just not a, I'm not a talkative person. You know, some people can talk all day, they've got the gift of talking or something, and I just don't have that gift. <laughs> But when I get into the pulpit, the anointing comes, and something happens. And therefore, I encourage them to come out. And I've had people, time after time, when they would take heed to that and come out, say, now I don't need counseling, because you answered it in the message. Don't you realize, dear soul, you've got all sorts of problems, and God loves you, and He knows that. And he, he brought this meeting together and he's sending anointed ministry in here to bring your problem and the answer together. Why it's so simple. And yet there are some people who won't be satisfied with that. They've got to have a half a day of your time for religious counseling because, you see, every one of us think that our problems are different. But you know the answers are the same. Jesus, Holy Spirit, faith. Because if I counsel with you for two or three hours, I'd end up with Jesus, Holy Spirit, faith. Whichever one you needed, all three or whatever one you needed. And uh, you have to understand this, that, that faith isn't going to come by you hearing it once tonight. Oh, it'll work some, yes. But you see, what are you going to do in time of testing? What if the symptoms come back? You've claimed your healing. And then I see you six months like I do see people and they say, I don't understand it. I was healed ten days. And then all the symptoms came back. I guess I wasn't healed. I said, no. But you know, if a person would come out all six nights or seven nights or eight nights or three nights while you were there, they would have known what to have done when the symptoms came back. They would know how to resist them and all. And you see, and you just can't, they can't hear that one night. Uh, I mean, because you read a promise once, faith doesn't come by just reading it once. You've got to get into that word and read it over and over and over and over, and faith will come. I'll guarantee it will come. If it doesn't come when you read it ten times, read it twenty. If it doesn't come twenty, read it fifty. If that faith hasn't been there on that promise when you read it fifty, read it a hundred or five hundred or thousand. Faith will come. Because he says faith comes by hearing the word. I was ministering up in Minnesota here a while back. And uh, I saw a husband and wife walk in that I knew from uh, another ministry in uh, Muncie, Indiana, where I'd been ministering for several, well, actually three and a half years. And I said to them, I said, praise the Lord, good to see you. But I said, you'll probably be hearing some of the same faith principles I've taught in Muncie, Indiana. I said, they need it up here too, you know. You can't just start all over if people have never heard it. You, I mean, people have to realize that. Oh, she said, she said, that doesn't matter. She said, we need to hear it again. She says, we need it again. Well, praise the Lord for people that, that can sit and hear the same principles twice. And that night, though, that isn't why I'm telling you that, the Lord gave her a vision. And she told it to us the next day. She said, I saw a tree house. You know what a tree house? The little boys build in the trees out of used lumber, rusty nails, use an old brick for a hammer. Well, do you or don't? Somebody, do you know what a tree house? <laughs> I mean, I have to explain what a tree house is if you don't know. But a tree house... She said, the Lord showed me a tree house, and it was all lopsided, and the nails driven half in. And the Lord, she said, spoke to me and said, that's your faith, the first time you heard Brother Freeman. He said, now that you're going to hear him again, you can drive the nails in. <laughs> Straighten it up. You know, get the thing built. And so faith comes by hearing. It's like a working man's need for three meals a day because he ate breakfast doesn't mean he can dispense with dinner and supper. He has to keep eating because you've eaten breakfast a few years. You can't say, well, I'm well acquainted with this. I think I can dispense with breakfast and I don't need that anymore. And so it is with the word of faith. You have to keep eating it because he says, when you ask anything according to my will, I hear you. And the only way I know for you to know what he said is to keep hearing it because I, my faith grows every time I hear me preach it. It does. Faith comes by hearing the word. I hear things come out by the Holy Spirit I never heard before. And I grow and I learn. I've been in meetings over and over where people get healed because they'll sit and listen to the word of faith and be consistent. Like in one meeting where a woman was deaf and she had her hearing aid. This was last summer. And we were preaching the word of faith. And then one night when I got done, I went on out and they began to jump up and give the testimonies of faith, how God had healed them and met their needs and all. And I learned about this uh, after it happened. And uh, she said, I was sitting there listening to the testimonies. 
of faith and all, and she said, I wondered why everybody began to talk so loud. (laughs) And she said, suddenly dawned on me that God had healed me. Sitting there listening to the word of faith. We see it happen all the time. As you sit and listen, you begin to respond unconsciously to the word of faith, and you begin to use faith as a normal response in your daily walk. You see, I don't have to pray about my material needs. I walk in total faith in Matthew 6, day to day. And because God sees me walking in that faith, and it's a constant confession of that fact, then He just blesses me abundantly. And it works that way for any promise that He makes us. But you see, you release your faith as you're paying the cost of hearing the faith because you're learning what God has promised you as you're sitting there hearing it. Uh, Erroneous ideas are getting straightened out. Some of your theology is getting buried where it ought to be. And, uh, and, and some of the truth is being resurrected out of the Word of God. I was in another meeting where I pointed over to, uh, in this section I said, there's somebody right here with a hernia, right here. You see, the Lord shows us things occasionally to quicken faith. And uh, nobody raised their hand. I just held on. I, you know, I just get kind of dogmatic sometimes. I'm not going to turn loose. I said, it's right here, it's right here. And finally a woman slipped her hand up. I said, is it you? She said, yes. And I said, you come after the message. God's going to heal that. That's why I showed it. And so I went on and preached the message of faith. And when I got done, I said, all right, we're going to start with you. You come. And then the rest of you who want healing, you come. Oh, she says, I don't have to come. She said, as I sat there listening to the word of faith, so that hernia just went down like putting a pin in a balloon, just (laughs) evaporated. She says, it's gone. She said it was so serious the doctors won't even operate on it because they're afraid to. And uh, she said, the reason I didn't raise my hand, she said, I didn't think there was much of this business. Somebody's always pointing out there and saying somebody's got something, you know. And she said, but she, she said, he just held on. He wouldn't take his hand away. He says, right over here, right over here. <laughs> but it was the word of faith. And in another meeting up in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, I said, somebody here has uh, a back trouble, pain, and serious, and you come and God will heal you. Well, the brother who had it didn't come because... He told me after why I couldn't. He said, when you called for that person with the back trouble, he said, that was me because, he says, I've had it for years. He said, I've been going to the chiropractor. He's been treating it. And this was Monday night. I'd started the meeting on Sunday night, teaching on faith. He said, I came Sunday and heard the message of faith. And he said, I had an appointment tonight to get a treatment for my back. And I had the choice between a treatment or another taking a gospel, you know, some medicine from the Word. And he said, I decided to come and get some more medicine out of the Word. And he said, when you called for the person with a bad back to come, he said, that was me, but it couldn't because he said, as I sat there listening to the Word, he said, God healed it instantly, disappeared. You see, it's the Word of God. We see this happen all the time. Mastoids, incurable things, uh, dry up. Uh, Rheumatoid arthritis, asthma, that God just heals instantly because... uh, It's not what I'm doing, it's what you're doing by your presence, hearing the word of faith. Because as you hear the word of faith, you know what God's will is. And when you know what His will is, then you can turn faith loose for it. Because He said, and prayer is not just words, friends, it's suddenly, you see, well, I see it now, divine healing is mine, and all I have to do is believe God and Oh, praise the Lord, Lord. And you're just sitting there communing with Him, not even uttering words, and your faith is released. Well, we'll be preaching on prayer this week, and you'll find out that prayer sometimes is just one word, like the name of Jesus. Sometimes, you know, when that old plane's falling, that's all the time you've got to say. That's one of the best best prayers I know. Jesus! You'd be surprised what'll happen. That's the name the Father hears the angels reverence and the demons tremble before And so, it's the word of faith that delivers and heals. The first pillar of faith is His word. You must know His word. And because Christians do not know His word, they're letting men teach them that it's not always God's will to heal the sick. It's what I used to teach. And you should always pray, if it be thy will or not my will, but thine be done. And God does not tell us to pray that way. That's man's teaching. Not about His promises. Pray not my will, but thine be done when you do not know his will. But when, you, when he gives you a revelation of his will, that they lay hands on the sick and they'll recover, he didn't say, go lay hands on the sick and say, now, Lord, if it be your will, let them recover. 
It's a revelation of His will to tell you to do that, to lay hands on the sick. When He says a prayer of faith will heal the sick, it will heal the sick. And so because we do not know His word, we cannot pray according to His will, and therefore we cannot release any faith. There is, there, this is so basic, is why you have to start here. You've got to pay the cost of knowing His word. I don't mean the letter, I mean the spirit of His word. And you'll find if, if you'll get into it and listen to the right teaching, you'll find that there are no exceptions to the promises of God. None at all. No exceptions. There are conditions. And that's where we've made our mistake. You see, we've not met a condition. We say, well, I must be an exception. No, there are no exceptions. If there were any exceptions, then he put the exception in the same verse or right under it, or at least in the context, then he doesn't do that. He says the prayer of faith will heal the sick. The prayer of faith always heals the sick. I've never seen the prayer of faith fail to heal the sick. But there are about five or six conditions in James 5, 15, 6, 14, 15, and 16 that we must meet. And you just fail to meet any one of those, you're not going to be healed. That is if you use James 5. If you use James 5, you better use oil. There's no healing in oil, but you just better do it the way God says. It's one of the conditions. And maybe some didn't get healed because they called for the elders of the church and you thought, well, I'll just go lay hands on them and pray. Well, he didn't say to do that. He said, anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord and the prayer of faith will heal the sick. And I already gave you three conditions right there. And he says, if you've committed any sins, confess your faults one to another so that you might be healed. There's another condition. Unconfessed sin keeps a lot of people from getting healed. And God doesn't show you their sins always. Sometimes you can say, you know, well, I, I see there's resentment in your heart. You'll have to give that up. But seldom does God show that. And that person, he's already dealing with them. If they don't give up the resentment, then there's a condition they did not meet. There's, that doesn't mean there was an exception because they didn't get healed. They didn't meet the condition. But this is why you have to know the Word of God. And when you know it, you can pray that prayer of faith. The easiest thing in the world for me to pray is the prayer of faith. And the easiest thing in the world for you to pray is the prayer of faith. But you cannot pray that prayer of faith if you think over there in Deuteronomy or Hezekiah or somewhere, or Leviticus, there's an exception. You have to know the Word. You don't have to be a theologian. You just have to know the Word. And you can learn the Word on healing in a one or two evenings, my friends. So that you can stand in faith on that. Oh, I've heard of exceptions, but there are none. Brother up in Canada, uh, I was up there twice, uh, I believe, last month. And uh, a brother said, well, we prayed for a man with cancer in our church. Uh, you were, uh, We had your book, and we read the book on faith, and we prayed for him. We believed that God healed him, and he died on us. And he said, it shook some of us up. We, he said, we don't know what to do next. I said, well, I'll tell you one thing, brother. There are no exceptions, but there are conditions. I said, if I would just take the time to talk to you long enough, uh, I could show you where you missed it. Because I said, in my experience, I can always show people where they missed it. They missed some condition. There are no exceptions from God's side. He, he makes a promise. He says, I'm not a man that I should lie. I'm not a man, a, the son of man that I should repent. He said, if I say a thing, I'll do it. If I promise you something, I'll bring it to pass. I said, that's God's side. And he began to talk, and uh, I said, you know, sometimes people think they have faith when it's, it's all in the head, it's not in the heart. They're not, they're not appropriating their healing. And his wife was sitting there, and they looked at one another and said, well, it is true uh, that he did uh, go and get some cobalt treatments after we prayed for him. That's right. Well, I said, brother, uh, that, that would be enough for him to miss his healing if, he, if he's trusting God to heal. And then he goes back and takes his treatments. And I said, this is, not, this is not God. This is trusting the arm of the flesh. And they said, yes. And we don't remember that he ever made a strong confession of faith. We never did hear him really say he believed God had healed him after we prayed. And so, so you see, as you begin to talk to people, you can find where they are missing it. I mean, because... You pray for someone does not mean they're going to be healed even though you've got all the faith in the world. They have to believe. And if they believe it, then they're not going to be trusting in the arm of the flesh. That's for the people who are not praying for their healing. And they're going to be confessing they believe they're healed. If you don't confess it, then you don't believe it. If you don't believe it, then you're not going to receive it. And another woman said, Oh, I know there must be exceptions because she said, I have a good friend that her husband died of leukemia. 
And they believed in divine healing, and they were even anointed. he was even anointed and prayed for, and he still died. And she said, there must be exceptions. I said, dear sister, there are no exceptions. I said, the husband or wife missed it somewhere. They missed a condition. I said, if I could ever talk to her, I could point out to you where she missed it. Well, I never thought I'd ever see the woman. And a few months later, this woman, and I didn't know it was her, came to fellowship in our church. And one day she talked to me, began to talk to me, about whether or not it was always God's will to heal the sick. She began to tell of a husband who died of leukemia. And she said, uh, the reason I'm asking you, she says, I'm not sure about divine healing. She said, we allowed prayer for my husband, but we were not sure of this. And said a Pentecostal pastor came in and wanted to anoint him with oil, but we're, we were afraid of that. And it, I came to find out this is the exact woman who's supposed to have all the faith, you know, for the healing of her husband. And she's even confessing her doubts to me. I mean, great doubts. In fact, this particular woman had enough doubt to sink a battleship about everything. And so I could just give you illustration after illustration how that a person cannot be healed just on your prayer if they are not believing. And so if you know the Word of God, then you're grounded in the Word, you're settled and you're stable, and you can't be shaken when it's cancer, tuberculosis, or an emergency, or a broken bone, and all of these things that we have seen healed. Yes, broken bones without medical treatment and that sort of thing. You can't be shaken when they say we're going to foreclose on the mortgage uh, if you don't have the money. And, and the money's already 30 days late that you've claimed and confessed would be there. Uh, but if you know the word, you know that they can't foreclose because the money will get there. And the last minute was not the last minute. It just seemed to be the last minute uh, when you thought it was the last minute. See, the last minute sometimes is not before you get cast into the furnace. The last minute is sometime to be delivered out of the fire, like Daniel's three friends. You know, they thought the last minute was the God... I mean, some people would think the last minute was before they were cast into the furnace, but no. A lot of times God will let you go into the fire, into the furnace, and He'll deliver you out of it. And I'll tell you, that'll teach you the difference between faith and hope. <laughs> and I... I, I, agree, I agreed with a brother for $30,000 and he got the money as soon as he got home. That same brother claimed a quarter of a million dollars and, and agreed to pay, pay it off within a certain period and when the day came, the money was not there. You'd say, well, he missed it, you know, the last minute. No, he had faith. He just held on because, you see, your calendar and God's may be entirely different. And so they gave him a 30-day extension. The money still didn't come, and they were so mad that they were, they were literally uh, red in the face about it. And he'd already been paying in on this thing, you know, and he was, uh, looked like he was going to lose it all, and, and so uh, he just held on. And the lawyer opened his mouth to say, we're not giving you any more deadline, we're going to foreclose. And he opened his mouth and said, by the Holy Spirit, like old Caiaphas did about Christ, he prophesied even though he didn't know, didn't know he was. He opened his mouth to say that we're not giving you any more time. He said, we're giving you three more days. <laughs> and I mean, he said that and it even surprised the lawyer. <laughs> and in three days, God supplied the entire balance of $140,000. I may tell you that story about Wednesday because it's beautiful. Uh, how all the details of that. And you saw, saw the, there are no exceptions to God's promises. Just hold on to His Word. And if you know His Word, even though the deadline arrives, you know that the deadline is wrong and that God is still going to meet another deadline. And it happens all the time. But you've got to know the Word. And then you can pray according to His will. Oh, it's, it's a blessed thing to be grounded in the Word of God because then if you are... You see, and you are suffering some financial uh, difficulty, then uh, if you know the Word, you know that my God will supply all of your needs according to His riches and glory. It's a blessed thing to know what your inheritance is, but all you have to do is ask Him and you have it. If you're suffering oppression or sickness, why, you don't have to as a Christian. It sure pays to know His Word, because then you can be delivered from that on your own confession. I mean, are you sick? Then, then let you, what you want to do is lay aside the faith-destroying teachings of man and get into the Word. I mean, get alone with the Word. Get away from your family and Job's friends and the church and everybody else. Get alone with His Word and you'll be surprised 
what God can show you. You'll see there that I am the Lord that healeth thee. He didn't say sometimes either. He said, I, that's it's the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's what the Scriptures say. God says, I change not in Malachi. And the church has changed his name to, I am the Lord that healeth thee sometimes. <laughs> or I am the Lord, I am the Lord that giveth thee the grace to bear it. But that's not his name. So if you need healing, get alone with the Word and the Lord, because He's the Lord that healeth thee. He's the one that said, But by my stripes you were healed at Calvary. He's the one that says in the Hebrew, not the King James, but in the Hebrew, Surely I've borne away your diseases and I've carried away your pains, and by my stripes you were healed. He's the one who confirmed that in Matthew eight sixteen and 17 when He was healing the sick and casting out demons. Matthew said this was to fulfill Isaiah's prophecy that Himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. And so, if you know the Word, then you can be healed. Do you have a loved one that you want to see saved? You can't talk to them about it? You can't talk to them about it, can you? Well, it certainly pays to know your rights and your privileges. If you get into the Word of God, then you could see you could stand in proxy for them and see them brought into the kingdom. And you won't even have to help God. In fact, He doesn't want your help. He wants your faith. Or you could claim Matthew eighteen 19. We'd agree together and you'd see the loved one saved. And you shouldn't look skeptical. Some of you. Because it's working everywhere we go. One woman claimed her whole family up in Fort Wayne. She said, let me tell you, it, just in a year, God's already bought, brought four of them in. I said, what would you do to help God? She said, nothing, just believe. Watching Him saving them one by one. Right up in Peoria, Illinois, we were last night. We agreed with a brother up there the last time we were in Peoria. You know what he said to me? He said, when I heard you say we could claim... Anybody, then I claim my father-in-law, he said that was the hardest nut to crack in the world. He said, you were here about a year ago. Let me tell you, he just brought him in last week. God saved him all by himself. <laughs> and you can't talk to these people. I prayed for a dear old mother for 14 years that would not even speak to me despised the ground I walked on as a Christian. Couldn't even talk to her about salvation. I just used a little of that faith. You see, I prayed for her for 14 years, and then when I received the Holy Spirit, I quit praying, and I saw what my inheritance was. I began to see these great promises, and I claimed her, and she was saved in 10 minutes. But you can't talk to them. I couldn't talk to her about the weather. couldn't talk to her about anything. She would run and hide if I'd even come in the house where she lived. You see, God is waiting for you to start to believe His Word. He didn't say you had to help Him do it. He didn't say you had to figure out little schemes and devices to get those loved ones saved. He just says to get out of the way and use your faith, because faith is the substance of what you hope for. Yes, faith will work. And if you know, if you know your inheritance, then you, if you know the Word, you know your inheritance, and you could come and stand in proxy for that loved one. Like this woman off in uh, Ohio did in one of my meetings said, I'm going to stand in tonight for my brother-in-law. And does he need saving and deliverance? He's an alcoholic. And he mistreats his family. And he's just beaten up his wife, knocked her teeth out, broken her arm, ran out half naked in the street, shooting his gun off. And they've arrested him. She says, I'm agreeing that he's saved on the basis of this message. Matthew 18, 19. I agreed with her. And she wrote us, or told us, I don't know which they write and call and all that. She said, let me tell you what happened. She said, while we were agreeing, something happened. That was a Saturday night. And she said, he called me and said, I'm out of jail. Well, that was a miracle. <laughs> he says, I want you to come and talk to me because he said, last night, he said, last night something happened to me over my jail cell. He says, I don't understand it. Well, that's when we were agreeing together. He said, something happened to me. He said, I want you to come, and she says, I know you're a Christian, I want you to come and tell me how to be saved. I want to know Jesus. And praise God, she said, I went over there and he was saved, and she said, that isn't the whole story. Eleven others have already been saved as a result of something like that, getting saved. Hallelujah. Oh, it pays to know the Word of God. Faith in the Word is the basic pillar. You see, your faith can't rise above the level of what you know, K-N-O-W, not hope or guess or suppose. Not even think you believe, but what you know, He promises you. I got healed of an incurable heart condition 
because I knew healing was in the Word, and I got healed on the very verses I was teaching in the seminary that are not valid for today. <laughs> Which proves a difference between believing a thing and knowing it. You can't, I mean, you can't just hope that's going to work. You have to know it. And when you know what His Word promises, my friends, and you are so grounded in the Word, that becomes a pillar of faith. Well, I won't take as long on the other three. The second pillar of faith is to know. I'm not done on that. I just quit. <laughs> Praise the Lord. The second pillar of faith is to know why God answers our prayers. Why God answers you. You realize many people, many Christians are not getting answers because they do not know why God answers them when they pray. Why is it that God heals some of them that we pray for and He doesn't heal others? He heals most, but why do some, why do some fail to get their healing? Well, you see, if, if you get into the Word, the first pillar of faith said, If you ask anything according to my will, I hear you. And if you get into the Word, you'll find healing is God's will all the way, promised all the way from Exodus fifteen twenty six to 1 Peter two twenty four. That's His will. And yet some people are not healed. It's His will to heal. Why are they not healed? It's because they don't know the basis upon which God heals them. Now, we're emphasizing healing. This is true, of course, of any promises made, thousands of them. And it's because they don't know why God heals them. I can tell when some people, when, when you're praying for the sick, I can tell what some people are thinking. You pray for them and nothing happens right away, and you can see what's going through their mind. They're saying, oh, Lord, I'm... It didn't happen again. I still got there. That lump's still there. Uh, and this is the ninth time I've been prayed for. And he didn't have anything either. And I fasted. I prayed. I've made restitution. I've confessed all known sins. I'm faithful. I go to church. Why, Lord, you've healed a half a dozen people here tonight. They're not half as faithful as I try to be. There's old Harry Smith over there. Well, he doesn't come out to these meetings at all. This is the first time he's ever been to a meeting like this. And you healed him instantly. Lord, why didn't you heal me? <laughs> well, I can see why God didn't heal her. Can you see why God didn't heal her? God is not going to heal a person because they say, Lord, I'm faithful and I go to church and pay my tithe and I fast and I pray and I made restitution and I confess all my sins. Those things are important. But God does not heal you because you're faithful and because you serve Him and because you love Him and because you have a need. God heals you because He says in His Word He will heal you and you believe His Word. If He healed you because of anything you did, I don't care how good the works are, it would be works. And that's an abomination in the sight of God. Don't ever say, God healed me so I can get back in the pulpit and preach if you're a preacher. Say, God heal me because you promised to heal me and I'm claiming it and I believe it. You can't get God to heal you on anything that you're going to promise to do for Him. Preachers are always trying to get healed because, you know, they say, God, oh, I need to get back in the pulpit. I want to serve you. I love you. Remember all those good sermons I preached and I want to, I want to pray for the sick. And they want God to heal them on the basis of what they did or what they promised to do. God does not heal preachers on the basis of what they promised to do for Him. He heals them on the basis of what He has promised to do for them. Don't you see that? It's all faith. All the hardest lesson you'll ever get a hold of is that God doesn't heal you because your family needs you, dear ladies. I had people, I had a woman say, would you pray for my hands? It's... She had a skin condition. She says, I can't minister to my family. Would you pray God would heal me so I could minister to my family? Brother wants healed because I've been out of work six weeks. Lord, I'm an honest man. I'm getting behind in my payments, and I, don't, I, want, I want to pay my debts. Lord, heal me so I can go back to work. Lord, heal me because I love you. My friends, God, this is a hard lesson to learn. And if I had a week or two, maybe I could build, up, uh, to build it up to say it a little more diplomatically. But... Permit me to say it just as firmly and clearly as I can. God does not heal you because He loves you or because you have a need. He knows your need before you ask. Matthew 6. You wouldn't have to ask Him to heal you if He healed you because you had a need for healing. He knows that better than you. I mean, He's got inside information. <laughs> and He doesn't heal you because He loves you. He provided healing at Calvary because He loves you. And He heals you by faith. That's the way He set it up. 
Salvation, deliverance, healing, and everything else. And it's a hard lesson to learn to think that God doesn't heal us because we got a need or because He loves us or we love Him. He does not. That's emotion. And emotion has a place. And that's what you hope is compassion. And compassion has a place. But He heals you because He promised to heal you in His Word. And you say, Lord, I believe Your Word. Now that's when God begins to rejoice on the throne. And He's going to say, great is that faith. That person's believing they're healed even though they don't deserve to be healed. He heals old drunks in the gutter. Before he does, 12 Christians have been baptized in the Holy Ghost for 12 years. Because the old drunk isn't trying to get anything but just his sins forgiven and his cancer healed. And he has nothing to offer God but a stinking old alcoholic prayer. And God heals him instantly. And the third pillar of faith is to know when God answers our prayers. When does He answer? Well, 1 John 5, 14 and 15 said, If we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And we know that if He hears us, we have, past tense, the petition we desire. So He says you have it when you pray, if you pray prayed according to His will. Mark eleven twenty four says, When you pray, believe you have received, and you shall have it. Now, when are you to believe you have received the answer? When you pray. Mark eleven twenty four, And so many times Christians are not receiving the answer to the prayers because they don't accept the answer when they pray. You are to accept the answer when you pray. The manifestation will come later. It may be a moment. It may be a month. It may be a year. If any of you can stand it, it may be <clears throat> poor old Abraham 25 years later. But he said, believe you have received when you pray. I see people come frequently in our meetings and say, you know, when you were here last time, you prayed for me and uh, I was healed, but said uh, I was only healed two days. Uh, wh- uh, what does this mean? Another one say, you know, I read your faith book and uh, I-, I tried this and uh, I put away my medicine, but I don't see any marked improvement. Can you tell me what this means? I still have my symptoms. Do you know what that means? I say, yes, that means that you're listening and looking at your symptoms rather than the Word of God. See, the Word of God does not say when you pray your symptoms leave. It says when you pray, believe you have received the answer to your petition. There is a difference. I mean, if you feel better, fine. I'm all for people feeling better immediately. I'm, if your symptoms leave and never come back, you don't have to battle symptoms uh, then fine, I'm all for that. But the Bible doesn't say a word about healing being in the area of feeling. It's in the area of faith. Faith is the substance of what you hope for, not feeling. And if you feel better after we pray, then you say, I'm healed. Well, what if you don't feel better? Then that means you're not healed, if you go by feeling. But if you go by the Word, then you accept the answer when you pray. Oh, friends, I, I tell you. You're just going to have to hear it all before you, for, before you uh, reject the fact that God says you are to believe that you have received when you pray. Not when you feel better, not when the circumstances change, not when you stop limping, not when the heart starts beating properly, not when the deaf ear actually opens. He says to believe, I have heard your petition. When you pray. Now, I can't preach every, uh, uh, every message that we need to hear in one sermon. And so you're just going to have to bear with that. That's what he said. To believe you have received when you pray. A woman said to me, that, that sounds like Christian science. Telling yourself you have something, you know. I said, no, that's, that's, that's Christian sense. She said, she said, that's mental suggestion. She said, it'd be dishonest to say I've got something I don't see. I said, it'd be dishonest to say you don't have it when God says you do, if, he, if you'll believe it. That's being dishonest because if he says it, then whatever uh, contradicts that has to be the thing that's, that's out of harmony. Don't you realize that if God says by your, his stripes you were healed at Calvary and you don't feel healed, that, that if you start confessing what he says, then the thing that contradicts what he says has to give way to what he says. I mean, he's God. Nothing can contradict God forever. That's why he says for you to believe when you pray you have received your answer. And you'll have it. And so she said it's mental suggestion. You know, telling yourself you've got something you don't feel or see yet. Well, now, if you mean by mental suggestion telling yourself you have something or telling yourself something is true that isn't true, well, that won't work. If the house is on fire and you see the flames and smell the smoke, you can just tell yourself all you want, the house won't burn, it isn't burning, and you just better be ready to get out. If the boat is leaking, 
and you can't swim, mental suggestion isn't going to help you. You can just suggest all you want that it isn't leaking. You can ignore the sense evidence that your feet are getting wet, but you better know how to swim. Mental suggestion won't work. But it's not suggestion, but confession. When you take a promise of the Word and confess it, even though your intellect, your reason, your feelings, Job's friends, the doctors, circumstances, and x-rays contradict what his, he says, then what God says will come to pass. The last pillar of faith is to know what God requires of you in the area of faith about these promises. And what does it require of you? This is Matthew 6.34. Would you mind looking at that or listening carefully to it? Matthew 6.34. Here's the last pillar of faith. Take therefore no thought. Mm. That's really hard to do, isn't it? Take no thought for tomorrow. For tomorrow can take thought for itself. He's telling us here, the last pillar of faith is to learn to live one day at a time. That's today. You can't live yesterday, it's past. And he says here, take no thought for tomorrow. And all through Matthew 6, he is stressing this emphasis of verse 34, to live today in total faith and trust in God. Live one day at a time. He's saying, stop trying to live tomorrow today. That's why you're sick. That's why you have your anxieties. That's why you're not getting answers to prayer. He says, just live today. And that's all I live. I forget the past. And I don't even concern myself with the future. I couldn't do anything about it anyway, because that's what he says. He says, just live today in total faith in Jesus Christ. And do you know what? What one day is, it's just 24 hours. There isn't a person here that couldn't trust God for 24 hours. Don't you believe you could trust God for a day? Why, sure you do. You'd be surprised how much faith then you can release one day at a time. And those of us who are walking by faith have put yesterdays behind us. We, have, we are taking no thought for the tomorrows, and we're just living today. We get in trouble when we try to live yesterday and tomorrow today. You can't do it, and God says you shouldn't do it. He's saying don't take any anxious thought or concern for tomorrow. You say, I don't understand that. I'm a businessman. If I didn't take thought, I'd go bankrupt. What am I going to do? I've got to save for the future. I've got to prepare for my children to go through college. Uh, you mean I'm not to be concerned at all? Well, he didn't say if you were a businessman, you couldn't buy anything, send out a purchase order for tomorrow, be delivered next week or something. That isn't what he's saying. There's a difference between concern and anxiety and worry. You see, I'm concerned when I drive my new, <clears throat> can I say it, Cadillac <laughs> down in Atlanta without a dime's worth of insurance on it. Now, I, I wasn't supposed to say that the first night either. <laughs> but you see, I've got assurance, Psalm 91, I don't need insurance. Praise Him. I'll guarantee you, if I mention both of those things and half of your back, you mean business. That's a fact. You can talk about broken bones and raising the dead and walking on water and people lay men and praise the Lord and all of that, and you get into the area where God will really supply their temporal needs and expects them to trust Him even to build a barn without a lightning rod on it. Right away, you lose them. You lose a lot of them. And so I'm concerned when I drive that Cadillac down without any insurance on it, down the streets of Atlanta, but I'm not worried. I'm concerned about what's going on around me. I'm watching. You know, you just, that's concern. I just don't get in two lanes at once and say, now Psalm 92 will protect me. That isn't the way it works. <laughs> but I'm not worried. I'm not anxious. And this is what God, what is Jesus talking about? He didn't say you couldn't take any thought in the sense that if you were a businessman, you couldn't send in a purchase order, or you couldn't make a few plans, but you are not to depend in your ability, your wisdom. You're not to be trying to, to build all sorts of fleshly securities around you and save for the future and rainy days and all of that. Like, this is going to give you some security, but you're to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and then He says you've got security. 
And you won't need to depend on worrying about what's going to happen tomorrow and all of that. You see, over half of the beds in the hospitals are filled with Christians who are mentally and physically sick because of emotional stress and worry because they do not take literally Matthew 6. Do you realize that? Emotional stress because they don't take literally Matthew 6. And, and Christians can have peptic ulcers just like non-Christians if they worry. I mean, worry will, will, will cause uh, all sorts of diseases and ailments. Doctors tell us 75% of all sickness is psychosomatic. It's in the mind. And most of that's emotional stress and worry and upset. And so uh, people are saying, you know, if I could just get a little more income, I could quit worrying. If I just get an increase in salary of 10 or 15%, then I could stop worrying and seek first the kingdom. No, if you got a 10% increase tomorrow in pay, you would increase your spending 10%. You'd increase your worries at least 10%. It's just a vicious circle. You'll never, you'll never get rid of the problem by getting more money. You see, I, I make more, God supplies more, as I say, in a year than many executives. And I used to get back, I remember in college I had an income tax report I filed, $700 a year income, had a family of five. You say, how'd you make it? I didn't. God did. God provided. But $700, and you know I didn't save any of that 700 And my income last year, uh, just to make my point, was was knocking at the door of forty thousand dollars, and we're not saving that either. You know, you see, it doesn't matter what your income is, my friends. You spend on the level, you see, of what your income is. You'll never find security trying to get a raise in salary. You'll find security when you've began to practice Matthew six. And the reason he can give me so much is because he knows I'm not saving it for a rainy day. I mean, we're using it. Uh, just publication of books. You spend $5,000 in a month or two uh, just at the drop of a hat, you know. Uh, it takes money to function in a ministry like this. But the point is, because I've got such a big income, you can think, well, a guy ought to at least save half of $40,000. Why, you don't save half of $40,000. And so quit trying to get a raise and pay so you can have some security, so that you can get to the place you can stop worrying. If you've got a $10,000 increase in salary tomorrow, you'd only increase your worries, $10,000, unless you have learned to quit finding, trying to find security in money our material things, and get your security in Matthew 6, and take no thought for tomorrow, then tomorrow the money will be there. And if it isn't there tomorrow, it'll be there the next day. It'll be there because it always has been there for going on 20 years now. You see, people are not secure today. They've got more money than they ever had, but they're more insecure than they were 50 years ago. Christians are dying by the tens of thousands of ailments, illnesses, Everything from heart conditions and, and nervous breakdowns and peptic ulcers and, and you name it, because of emotional stress and worry, because they've never learned that it doesn't matter how much money they have or get, it doesn't matter how many bedrooms are in their home, it doesn't matter how many cars they own, it doesn't matter how much food they can buy, they can still only live one day at a time. They can still only eat one meal at a time. They can still only sleep in one bed at a time. They can only drive one car at a time. And even the man who collects your garbage can do that. And he doesn't have your ulcers. So Jesus is saying, if you want to learn what total faith is, then do what I said and take no thought. This is where I started in 1952 in Matthew 6. That's why that, that we have such a blessed life and walk of faith is because we were shut up to bankruptcy and it was either, it was either God or failure. And, and praise the Lord, it, it was a wonderful choice just to turn yourself over to the Lord. You couldn't do any worse, friends, than to believe God. <laughs> all, all you can do, I tell some people when, you know, they're saying, Oh, what if I die if I just trust the Lord? Well, I said, you can't do any more than die. You know, you'd think like you were losing your salvation or, or the world would explode ahead of schedule or something. You're not going to die if you believe God for a promise. But I'm saying, you know, let's face it. Uh, you couldn't do any more than starve or die. 
It's not like you were totally lost for eternity. We're making such a big thing out of trusting God. So all I could do, I was already bankrupt. I couldn't do any worse. And, and I wasn't thinking in those terms. But let's face it, friends. When it's God or failure, then it'll never be failure if you trust God. And Christians have to learn it doesn't matter how much money you have, that you're going to worry. It doesn't matter how much security in a material way you have. You're going to worry about your security. You're going to build the fences a little higher next year, get some new locks for the doors, uh, uh, get a, a bigger caliber gun to keep the people away from stealing, uh, the bigger safe you bought to hide your money in. And the watchdogs, you need two. I mean, you never get security in fencing things in and trying to find security and protecting what you... The only security you'll ever find is to take no thought for tomorrow. No thought. And seek first the kingdom of God. In fact, the only way you're going to live that victorious life that we talked about earlier, 365 days a year, is to start living those 365 days one day at a time in total faith. You see, I don't worry about tomorrow is why I have victory today. I don't even think about tomorrow. I have to go look at the schedule to see when to speak. You know, that sort of thing. Now, I'm not uh, an absent-minded professor and careless, but the point is I'm not concerned. I, 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 I make sure I'm prepared for tomorrow. Praise the Lord. You see, that's all I'm called to do, to be prepared to give an answer for the hope that's in me. Learn to live a day at a time. Do you realize the only place you can live yesterday and tomorrow today is in your mind? You realize that? You can't live yesterday and today except here. And that's why you're sick. That's why you've got ulcers. That's why you've got worries and anxieties. God never designed that computer, you, to function that way. I mean, you're a very intricate piece of uh, machinery, very expensive and intricately and complex uh, machinery. God has made you, and He's got tapes. I really mean this. He's got spiritual tapes, as it were, that, that feed into you. And, and if you get the wrong tapes in there, that's why all the confusion and chaos and mix-up. I mean, this is what, what, what he's talking about in Matthew 6. When you start worrying about tomorrow, that's, that what you think affects your glands and your nervous system. You're putting the wrong tapes. You're, you're not programmed for that. And that causes something to happen in your stomach. You secrete too many gastric juices, and it results in peptic ulcers, and Christians get sick. And then that can become a cancer. Fear, Job said, that which I fear has come upon me. And so we must see that you can't live tomorrow, yesterday, today, except in your mind, and that's where you get in trouble. And so learn to do what Jesus said. To live today in total faith in God. Put the yesterdays behind you. Take no thought for the tomorrows. You can do it. Just tell yourself you can. Because that's your confession. I can don't say, I can't, I can't, I can't. Say, I can, I can, I can. Praise the Lord. Will you say that? Would you stand with me? Hallelujah. Would you stand with me? Amen. Hallelujah.